Now entering Nerdist.com. I guess is one of the finest actors of our time and an all-around stellar human being. This man can do everything. He was hilarious in Malcolm in the Middle, terrifying and yet beloved as the iconic Walter White in Breaking Bad, and incredibly presidential as Lyndon B. Johnson on both stage and screen in All the Way. Um, after he snagged his Tony, went and got himself his first Academy Award nomination for playing blacklisted screenwriter Dalton Trumbo. And let's be real, this man has so many nominations and awards and crazy life experiences. He wrote a book about it called The Life in Parts, and I don't even, I can't even list the insane stuff that's in here. You absolutely have to read this book. We're going to cover as much of it as we can. Uh, we're going to talk about the Breaking Bad things that I'm sure you want to talk about. So let's just say his name, and then I will tell you that tonight, Brian Cranston is talking with Chris Hardwick. <laughs> Twitter and Instagram and Facebook using at talking and the hashtag talking hardwick. So I'm going to read your questions, comments, comments. We have video messages. People from the audience are going to ask questions. Uh, but I'm going to start first. Thank you so much for doing my show. So good to see you again, man. It is very good to see you. Brian has been uh, very, very cool to me. You've done uh, podcasts with me. Yeah. Like we've hung out. I mean, it's. I did the, the, the Breaking Bad after show, Talking Bad. We broke down a little yes. bit. And then the last time I saw you was in New York. You were. Uh, Co-hosting the the Kelly show. Yeah, live with Kelly, and you and you came on, and you and I uh, butt danced we a little bit. We had a, a really bit. nice. That's thing. probably why you didn't get the co-hosting. <laughs> I'm just guessing. Seacrest. <laughs> I, mean, I feel like I shout that several times. Seacrest. Yes. Yeah. Every, everyone needs it. He's my Gus Fring. <laughs> 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 But your IMDb page is about 10 pages long. You've done pretty much everything there is to do in film and television, going back to, what, was your, what, what year was your first job? 1979, what, professionally, yeah. Professionally, yeah, what was it? Uh, I was doing an uh, a, a Aero Shirts commercial, and uh -huh. I got, uh, I got uh, my SAG card. That, well, actually, my SAG card came when I was doing an extra work. And I was watching the set, and we were doing this TV movie called To Race the Wind. Uh -huh. And um, Steve Gutenberg plays a blind college student, and we're playing this, this, uh, this fraternity football game. He does comedy in it, though, right? <laughs> yes, he does. yes, I do remember yeah. this. Yeah. And, he, and he, uh, we, he, needed the quarter, uh, he needed a quarterback, the, the director. And he, he looked over me, and he goes, hey, you, kid, come here. And I, I, I'm holding a football. I go, yeah. And he goes, you ever play football? I go, yeah. He goes, you ever quarterback? I go, yeah. Lies. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, uh, okay, I need you to say uh, hike and throw the ball over here. And then, it's, oh, great. And I knew. I said a word. This means I can get my SAG card. So I'm there. I go, um, he goes, ready and action. And I go, 44, 13, <laughs> 92. Uh, cut. <laughs> <laughs> so what the hell are you doing? I go, well, I know that it, this story takes place in New England, so I thought I would add... Uh, he goes, no, no, just say hike. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll just say hike. And I said, oh, can I say hike? He goes, no, <laughs> just say hike. <laughs> I go, okay. And so that's how I got my sad card. I say, actually, by saying the word hike. This takes place in 1930s New England, right? <laughs> 45, hike, hike, hike. There goes Steve Gutenberg. <laughs> but, but beyond that, I mean, uh, Hill Street Blues, Baywatch, Murder, She Wrote, uh, the original Flash series, Matlock, L.A. Law, the original Power Rangers series, Walker, Texas Ranger, Touched by an Angel, Babylon 5, Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Wow. I uh, love that that got the applause. I have trouble saying no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember when you were on the, the, the first time you came on the podcast a few years back, you know, I, 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 was, I was approaching you like most performers where I go, wow, you know, what are your insecurities and what did you have a fallback career? And you were like, no, I was never insecure about it and I never had a fallback career. I knew this is exactly what I always wanted to do. When I was 22 years old is when I made my decision that this is what I was going to do. And I think like most people entering the arts, you have to have an all in kind of mentality. If you have only one foot in and thinking, well, if this doesn't work, I'm going to go back and run my family's dry cleaning business. Right. Then, then you're not, then when there's resistance, you go, oh, I guess that's not working, so I'll, 
I'll go that way. I didn't have a backup plan. I knew that I loved what I was doing, and if given the opportunity, I thought I had faith in myself that I could possibly do something. And, and my real goal had always been, I just want to make a living as an actor. If I could earn my living as an actor, that's all I really want to achieve. And that happened when I was 25 years old, and uh, it is still my proudest professional achievement that, that I can say that I'm an actor and have been for many years now. I mean, was there, was there, ever, was there ever a point where you thought, well, maybe this isn't, you know, I don't know, never? No. I knew that if this meant that my decision would, uh, I'd have to share an apartment with three other actors or whatever, then that's, that's what I'm going to do. That's how much it meant to me. And, you know, and you have survival jobs everywhere you go. And I wrote about it in the book is that I uh, loaded trucks. You know, Andy Garcia was one of, the, one of the other actors on the loading dock. And these guys were screaming at you. Cranston, let's go. Move it faster, faster. And it's like, okay. And you, and you feel that pinch every time someone screams your last name only. Because that's so impersonal. Right. And they don't care who you are. What, they only want whatever muscle you are able to bring them and <laughs> load that truck. Um, I was a videotape interviewer at a dating service for like a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what's your perfect Sunday was a lot of that, like how many people describe their... Well, a lot of people would, would have something memorized and say, hi, my name is Joe. And I like walks on the beach, and, and I would go, okay, Joe, let's, <laughs> let's settle down. And I, I had a little secret button when I was going to start that tape. Yep. And I would sit in there for as long as it took until Joe got off of this, out of his head about, oh, this is what I'm supposed to present, and just relaxed. And I would say a joke, and he'd laugh, and maybe I'll start it then. And he wouldn't even know. And we would talk, and it would just be an exchange, a real exchange, and it, it allowed Joe to be seen for who he really is, not some guy trying to be impressive. And uh, it, was really, it was really fun because that, that organization, Great Expectations. Is <laughs> I, I've heard of that place yeah. before, yeah. And it really worked. Did, I mean, you, you're, so you're essentially directing people. Are you kind of, if you know you want to be an actor, are you using these people as a character study at all during Always. this time? Every actor, I tell young actors this all the time, you should never be bored. Life is out there. You should always use that as your classroom. Uh, I would go to the mall with my wife, and she would be shopping, and I'd have a magazine or, you know, or a newspaper, and I would just open it up like this uh, so I could be watching people. <laughs> and if they looked over to me, I would just drop my eyes and just... It wasn't my book. Right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that guy, look at that guy. What is he? It's crazy. No, I'm... Oh, brother. Reading about myself. This is how gripping the story is. I'm <laughs> engaged. And I would just get close to people and watch them. And for actors, we're attracted to, to human behavior so that we can replicate it at some other point down the road. And so most people, if they're seeing people argue or in an intense, like, fight or something, I would get as close as I can to them. <laughs> like a wild animal without, without affecting their behavior. Do you know what I mean? Without right. having them go, who's this guy sitting two feet from me? What do you want? Um, so I'd watch them and watch their behavior. And so anywhere you go, you could be working. You should be working. And what did you, was there anything consistent that you learned about human behavior by studying people at the mall so much? It was not only that, but any, you know, uh, at the airport, uh, great people watching at the airport. There's a lot of excitement. At, go, at a wedding, uh, emotions are high. I was happier when I was married. Uh, when am I going to get married? Or they'll break up in six months or whatever. <laughs> you know, there's cynicism. And, there, there's all kinds of energy uh, everywhere. You just have to, to be open to the behavior. And you can, what, what I used to do and what I still do with my wife, we play a game. You know, we watch a couple and then we, we see how they're relating to each other and then guess. This feels like this feels like a second date because uh -huh. they're a little more familiar with each other. It's not so formal, but they're a little they're a little comfortable. But it's not 
fourth or fifth date. They haven't had sex yet. Right. You know. They're still fidgeting. They're still, they're they're still, still kind of, like, of trying still to be on the their dance. best behavior. Hey, please like me. Yeah, yeah, please like me. Yeah. My name is Joel. It's Joel, <laughs> Joel it's and Joel. laughing too hard yeah. at their yeah. jokes and things yeah. like that. And so you play that game, but that also is great for actors and writers to, to study people and behavior. So if you're writing or acting in a scene where you're on a second date, we went, oh, wait a minute, I, I think I know how to behave that way, honestly. Yeah, but, there's so, but I feel like there's a difference. I think when people are acting from their conscious mind, it's like, oh, they're playing a result in a scene. Oh, I guess I'm very angry now, you know. But where do you find the layers? Like, where do you find, how, how, do you, how do you sort of connect and make it authentic so that it's part of the natural language of your, of your body? You know, an actor needs to rely on, on several different things. Um, one is talent. You really, you have to have talent. You have to be able, and you can't, you can nurture talent, but you can't teach someone how to be talented. You can find the ways to get them to open up. Um, when you're developing a character, like Walter White or, or anyone, really, um, you have this blind faith that if you do your homework, it'll come. You, you are welcoming that character into your being, and you trust that it's going to be there. You don't always know for sure if it's going to come, and that's kind of the excitement of it, but you have to trust. So there as many things. First of all is the talent. Then you have to be able to love the research part of it. You know, what, what can I research to get in tune with this character? With Walter White, I just went back to, I went to USC and studied uh, with their chemistry professors there. I walked around and I went into class and I, I reacquainted myself with the world of chemistry because that's, that was his world. But I didn't do any research on cancer at all because I wanted to discover that as Walter White was starting sure. to discover that. Um, and then there's your own personal experience. Uh, if you open up and you go, I, I felt this way before, or I have felt rage in my life, so I can use that. So actors have to be able to voluntarily open up the cavity of emotions and reach in and pull it out and say, here it is, in all its doubt or insecurity or vulnerability that may be, here it is. And then the last thing is your imagination. Whatever you can't have or you don't have in your own personal experience um, and you're not getting it from the text, you have to use your imagination of how, how can I connect the dots of this character. Uh, before we go to break, I want to let you guys know the extended version of this chat is available as a Nerdist podcast. Also go to amc.com slash talking for bonus clips, exclusive content, links to the podcast for every one of our episodes. More with Brian Cranston in a moment. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, Brian Cranston is our guest tonight. Um, is it, uh, what, I'm sure people have asked you this before and I apologize, but I genuinely want to know, what's the experience for you watching Better Call Saul? Oh, I love it. I love that show. In fact, every time I, I get together with, um, with Vince Gilligan or Peter Gould or any, uh, any of the cast or jo- Jonathan Banks or any of them, I tell them, I, don't, t- don't tell me anything, don't say anything, because I just want to be a, a fan. I just yeah. want to be, I don't want to know... I don't want to find out something and go, oh, I wish I didn't know that. I want to be a fan because I love the show. So I just, and... Spoiler alert, you kill Mike Ehrmantraut. What? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Breaking Bad really did become a phenomenon. And it really was, I think, without hyperbole, I can say, is one of the greatest shows in the history of television. It has a, everyone on the show is amazing. The soundtrack, the direction, the, the set design, the colors... And it's a really a perfect arc. The five-season arc is perfect, and it really respected the fans. With Walter, was it um, the, the guy that he became, did he become that person because of the events that befell him, or was that guy underneath there the whole time suppressed by, you know, this sort of cookie-cutter lifestyle that he had, that he had before right. he got his diagnosis? I think it's the latter. I think, I think all of us are born with everything that we have the potential to become. So we could either become the best of who we are or the worst of who we are or anywhere in, in the middle of that spectrum. And because I, what I really learned about that, you know, Walter White started, I was a milk toast kind of guy, depressed from missed opportunities and that sort of thing. And he became a dangerous person. 
because of what he focused on, what his agenda became. And what I realized is even the meekest person among us could become dangerous under the right set of circumstances. If someone is pushed to the corner or they feel they don't have a way out, they could really become dangerous. And that's what happened with Walter White, is that he put himself, through his decision-making, into a position where he had to just come out fighting until, the last, until his last breath. But it was, such an, it was such an interesting journey because he really... There really is, like, it was that idea of, like, well, there is a sense of altruism behind having to do this horrible thing to support his family after he's gone. But at a certain point, he seems to get addicted to the power, and then it's like, well, it's not really about them anymore. It's really, he becomes this incredibly powerful, narcissistic character, in in a way. Did you feel that way about him? There are many people who are incredibly powerful, narcissistic characters. (laughs) In our world these days. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. I have um, no idea what you're talking about. Yes. I mean, that was one of the things that I, I discussed with Vince Gilligan early on, is that, okay, we're going to go, and he did a broad scope. We want to go from Mr. Chips to Scarface. Right. Um, and I said, well, I, I think we, we, we want to explore all that he is, his ego and his hubris and, and all that he starts to not only uh, experience, but nurture. He nurtures those things. He has a sense of power. It's an aphrodisiac for a man. A man who is is powerless and then finds power is, is, you know, such an attractant. Sure. Right? And so I think everybody can relate to that because I think every human being is looking for their own personal empowerment. Some people find it in their families, in their church, in their work. I think that's what Walter White was trying to find, and he found it. We have social media questions. Let's see. Uh, uh, Tar Heel Boy N- N- NC wants to know, what element of Walter White was hardest for you playing the character? Um, you know, it was to see the disintegration of his family, I think. In the very first chapter of the book, I wrote about probably the most harrowing experience I had on the show, and that was... When Jane, remember Jane, yeah, of uh, dies. When Jane yeah. dies of... Kristen Ritter. Yeah, Kristen Ritter, who's a terrific actor. And when she dies and Walter White watches her die and has an impulse to help her, then stops himself, and maybe another impulse, then stops himself again, and then it's too late. Um, you know, I always think about what are the possibilities emotionally in a scene, and I'll, I'll even sometimes write them down. Oh, well, he, he could look at her and go, my God, uh, she's so young, she could be my own daughter. Um, and then over here, I'll write, but she got Jesse hooked on heroin. You know, why to save her? Why not to save her? At least I'm going back and forth. So I write these down as possibilities, and then I forget about it and let whatever happens in the scene happen in the scene. And there was a moment when I'm looking at this, this young girl choking to death on her own vomit and going when... Kristen Ritter's face just kind of disappeared, and replacing it was my own real daughter's face. And I saw my daughter choking to death. And that, it, I mean, that's the, a parent's worst nightmare, is something happening to your kid. And even now, when I talk about it, I can still feel the emotion just kind of rattling, because it is a real, it's, a, it's the fear that every, every dad has, I think, and every mom. Um, and so she appeared, and then it caught me off guard, obviously, and then that disappeared, and Kristen's face came back and cut, and I, I wept. And Anna Gunn was there, and she's holding me, and it was like, it was very emotional. And, and that's the, it's a, an emotionally risky profession. I mean, I don't know, for lack of a better way to express this, like, how do you leave it at the door when you leave, or do you need like an hour when you get home, like, I just need an hour to decompress, leave me alone, and then I'll be back to normal. Well, by and large, we shot, I mean, we shot the entire series in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and right. my, my wife and daughter were at home in Los Angeles most of the time. They would come out and visit. And, but my daughter was in school, you know, so there was, we weren't going to take her out. So a lot of times I was alone. And my routine was I didn't want to take Walter White home with me. It was too traumatic and too exhausting. And so I would go into the hair and makeup trailer and take two hot, moist towels and wrap one around my head like it was a, a turban 
and I would wrap one around my face like I was going to get a professional shave. And I would just sit there in the chair and allow the heat and the moisture just to pull out all the toxins and emotional waste and just, like, pull it out. That's what I was imagining anyway. And then I would wipe my head, my bald head and my face clean, take off Walter White's clothes, and I left him. I didn't, I didn't take him home with me, and I just I didn't want to. Because it, it would be too exhausting to do yeah. that. Well, I, I love hearing how comfortably you're talking about it now, because I remember at the time when Breaking Bad was wrapping up, and I, I sensed a bit of like, uh, I just, I'm, I'm trying to get through the, you know, like you're tra- you were kind of just trying to get past it a little bit. Like you were processing it still a little bit. And all of a sudden, something that was in kind of your rearview mirror, everyone was like, oh my God, talk about Walter White, talk about Walter White, talk yeah. about Walter White. Was it exhausting by the end? It, well, it was, I mean, it was an extraordinary experience. And I will forever be inextricably tied to Breaking Bad, and I'm proud of that. Um, but as an actor, I don't want to rest on that. I want to see what else I can do and challenge myself and move into a different direction. So I, I, that's why I selected a, a play, to go do a play and get away from the medium of television because I felt that Walter White became an icon, iconic character. Yeah. And it's like a, like a boulder I could either try to keep that boulder from going down the hill or I can let it go. I let it go and let it become whatever it's supposed to become to fans, to critics alike, and, and I just let it go. I let it, allowed it to be whatever it is and know that that is part of me, but that I didn't want to have that as my ultimate definition. Sure. Even though I think when I die, that'll be the, the headline, right? <laughs> Breaking Bad star blows up or whatever. (laughs) (laughs) Why would you? What a way to go out, by the way. uh, I would expect nothing less. (laughs) He just spontaneously combusted. Just combusted. Right on stage. (laughs) I mean, it was terrible, but kind of rad. And people are going to go, wow. Wow. That was part of it. Poor Joe's going to be like, that guy helped me get laid that one time with the video. (laughs) I made the video. Cut to Joe, still alone in his house. I gotta be more real. I guess no one real. wants a man with a really wide penis. That was his one defining quality. Joe <laughs> yeah. had a really wide penis. But I, I, I honestly, when <laughs> that's the character that I've built, <laughs> that'll be clipped out. Right. <laughs> You're gonna, you can't cut Joe's wide penis. Uh, but when you, but the, when we, when we first started talking, it was, and you, were, you were still, still doing Breaking Bad. You said, you know, for you, survival was all about um, your, your career. Survival was all about taking a completely different path, just like you just said. So coming out of Malcolm, because you had done a bunch of comedy work before that, sitcoms, sitcom pilots, sitcoms themselves. You know, Hal was, was an incre- you know, com- incredibly comedic role. And it's like, oh, that guy actually also can do this over here. But, I, but at the time, did people know that coming out of Malcolm Little? Did you feel like you were going to be typecast as like yeah. that, that kind of a guy? Most, most people like to have order in their life. They like to be able to go, oh, this is, he does this and she does that and this is what. Uh, and I, I wanted disorder in my career. I didn't want anybody to say, oh, he's a comedy guy or he's a drama guy. I remember I did a soap opera when I was 25 years old mm-hmm. in New York for two years. And then shortly thereafter, oh, he's a, he's a soap guy. And it's like, oh, okay. And I did comedies. And they go, oh, he's a comedy guy. And they were like, oh. So no matter what you did, whatever you did last is that that's the guy you are. They talk. He, uh, Chris Hardwick, he's the talking guy. The talking guy. Yeah, the yeah, talking the talk- guy. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. talking guy. Yeah, they're going to, and, and at some point you're going to go, okay, I'm going to smash that this way. I'm going to move out and carve my way into something else, whether you write a book or whether you do something else. Well, it's, but it is a, you know, it's kind of like where, where is the risk? Is it, is it risky to try new things or is it risky to not try new things? You know, because you, especially with, with what we do, you do get it, it. It's scary a lot of the time because you don't know what's coming around the corner. And so, do you? But but the way you describe it, it feels like oh, it, it's risky to not try new things. And if you seek too much comfort, you'll just get locked into one thing. There is a, a feeling that I have before I go on stage. Uh, I always stand backstage when I'm doing a play, 
and there you feel the butterflies. You feel life moving inside of you. And I take three deep breaths, and I shake it inside my body, and I, my eyes pop open, and I go out on stage for the first time. And and it's a ritual that I do. Um, and it is a way just to connect to it and say, yeah, there's a, there's a little bit of fear connected here. There's a little bit of, it's kind of titillating. And you can use that energy and to motivate you. You don't want to be f- afraid. You don't want to be fearful. In other words, the, an actor needs to be able to find a, a, a foundation of comfort and calm in order to perform. Without having that, you can't concentrate. Without concentrating, you can't be creative. It, it, everything stopped. If you're just thinking of what line am I supposed to say now, you're in a bad place. So a, an actor has to find a way to get comfortable in this very strange environment that really is odd. Do you know what I mean? Here we are sitting in front of a bunch of people talking about things. But you've done this a long time, and I've done this a long time, and we're unusually comfortable in this <laughs> position, right? Almost more comfortable talking in front of people than I am, like, just one-on-one with someone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, if I was that. at a party and someone's like, how do you like the party? I'd be like, oh, I enjoy uh, it. The party's fine. Party's I, fine. I can't talk. I can't, so don't look at me. <laughs> you know, but here in front of people, yeah, it's just, it's just our brains it's are just wired a little unusual, bit differently. Is it? Yeah. But, with, you know, but when you're playing, when you're playing Lyndon Johnson who was, you know, a a real person, do you approach him like a fictional character or do you approach him like, this is a guy I need to be true to who he was? Um, With a non-fictional character, your your person, the guy you're playing, did something notable enough to write about. So you want to honor that. And in, in the case with Dalton Trumbo as well as Lyndon Johnson, they both had two daughters and all four were both in, uh, incredibly helpful to me in finding the essence of that character. You never want to do an impersonation, right? but you need to be that dry sponge and just keep pulling in information, just keep pulling in information. It's like osmosis, and at some point that dry sponge becomes wet and full and heavy and you feel that character seep into you. And that's when you know you have it. From that point on, you can improv on stage as that character because he's, you're, you've got him. He, he is inside of you. I can't describe it any other way other than the comfort and the relief in many ways that this character you finally got. And it's, it's, it's a wonderful experience. Do you feel like you understood him better by the end of the experience? Uh, very much and so. And who was he? Who, do you, who was he to you? Lyndon Johnson. Yeah, yeah. He was, a, he was a big man with big ideas. He, was, he had ambition as big as the state of Texas. He had insecurities as big as the state of Texas. He was a man who, through his own set of circumstances, um, became a, a real pioneer. Um, when he was a boy, his mother uh, would often withhold uh, nurturing and even to the extent that she, at times, would ignore him and pretend that he wasn't even there as a little boy um, because she was displeased with the grades or how he was behaving or whatever, and she, and she did that, um, which was incredibly impactful to him. I think that experience with his mother created an empty vessel that he was never able to be filled. He never was able to be loved enough. So he was insatiable. His desire to appeal to people and have people love him. Many times you would hear him say, well, if the American people don't love me by now, then they're never going to love me. I'll, I'll give it up. And he would offer up that kind of emotional threat of suicide. And, and it was up to Lady Bird or people are, no, honey, you're fine. You're, you're, people love you. They do love you. Well, I don't feel it. They're not giving it to me, you know. And, this, and, he, and they would reach to him and bring him back from the precipice of, of saying, to hell with it all. And, and there was one other experience. When he graduated from Teachers College in, in Texas, he got a job, one of the only jobs he could, in a little place called Catula, Texas, a little dirt town, dirt road town. And um, he got a job teaching multiple grades to these immigrant families, Mexican kids whose parents were uh, migrant farm workers. 
And these little kids looked up to him with such reverence and love. They were at his beck and call. They did anything he asked of them. They were attentive. They, they just, and he loved them because they tried. A lot of them didn't speak a lick of English, but they tried. They were attempting, and he would hug them, and he would love these little children. And in the town, unfortunately, he would hear the white um, establishment uh, derive, uh, you know, uh, pleasure out of being abusive, uh, you know, verbally abusive to these kids and their families, and it hurt LBJ. It, it hurt him and it affected him deeply that these little children who are so filled with love and desire were being just dismissed as trash. And, it, and that was at the base of him as well, as, in his soul. So when it came time, six months after the, the assassination of, of John F. Kennedy, to pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964, he drew on that experience to say, What has been happening in this country is just dead wrong. And I am willing to go and risk my political career because he was in with the Dixiecrats in the South. I'm willing to risk that to achieve this, what is right. And, And so from that, it was like wonderful to be able to absorb all that information and be able to stand up tall and and be able to present that. Um, it was both historic and, and entertaining the way it was presented for, uh, by Robert Schenken, who wrote the play and the screenplay. So when you hear stories like that, because obviously so many people that we see, we think of them as very, you know, one-dimensional. Oh, it's, it's Lyndon Johnson, and he, he was president for a while, and he did some <laughs> stuff, but don't really think about him as, as, as the person, as the guy. Right. Then... You, did this affect, did, did his story affect how you presented your memoirs, your, your autobiography, when you wrote A Life in Parts? Was, was there anything about his story that informed you, like, oh, I want to tell this kind of story so people understand who I am or my humanity or, or anything like that? Well, for a long time, 38 years, I've been an actor. And as I mentioned, you have to be able to voluntarily open up and say, yeah, here's when I was insecure, here's when I felt depressed here's when things weren't working well and how you adjust to those hurdles and how you pick yourself up and use your friends and 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 you continue on down the road uh the only thing i wanted to make sure was that when i write this book is that um it's honest so there are things in there that i'm not necessarily proud of but it's honest and it's it's exactly what i experienced Excellent. When we come back, our audience members are going to ask questions. I'm going to give away things. Uh, We want to hear from you guys at home. If you want to be part of the show, at Talking Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, exclusive updates about upcoming guests, and you can ask any questions you want, and I will do my best to try to get to them. No matter who we're talking to, I want you to be a part of the conversation. We're going to talk to Brian Cranston more in just a little bit. We'll see you in a few on Talking. Welcome back to Talking to Talking. Brian Cranston is here. Doing an incredible Brian Cranston impression. Uh, some questions from the internet. This is a Seinfeld question from Mika424. How did you land the role of Dr. Tim? Through a regular audition. Uh, Tim Watley was uh, uh, the, the dentist to the, that crazy group. And every time that I went on the show, I did like six different episodes. Um, it was, for all I knew, the last time I was going to do it. But I remember the audition. Jerry was in there, and I made him laugh. If you can make Jerry laugh, and he's not an easy laugh. If you, well, I say that, and yet there was one time. Can I tell a story? Sure, please. Okay. I was in the dentist's office, and I asked uh, my dental hygienist, can I have the nitrous oxide? It's the laughing gas, and I put it on Jerry. He goes out, and then he thinks that my hygienist and I are molesting him. <laughs> And he says, you know, his shirt was untucked. And he goes, well, wait a minute. I don't think it was tucked. I think it was tucked in when I got in there, and now it's untucked. I don't know if it was tucked or untucked. Um, (laughs) So we rehearsed this scene, and they all go to another scene. I stayed on that set to get used to the stool and the instruments and where things were. And I hear a voice saying, hey, you know it would be funny? And I look out, and on a ladder, adjusting a light, is a guy. I go, you're talking to me? Yeah. I went, what? He goes, 
It'd be funny if you first took a hit of the laughing gas before you gave it to him. <laughs> and I thought, my God, that is funny. So I waited until we were shooting. And then sure enough, I go, uh, nurse, may I have the nitrous oxide? And I took the thing and I went, yeah, that's good. You know, and, I, and Jerry falls over laughing. Just, it was hilarious. And Larry David, who, who sometimes when he's in his, in his head, he doesn't laugh at something. He recognizes humor. Yeah, that's funny. That's funny. That's good. That's funny. Good. Funny. Good. Yes. Good and funny. Yeah. Um, he said, Jerry, stop laughing. Let's do it again. Keep it. That stays. Okay. Nurse, the nitrous oxide. And, the, and I just ask for it. And Jerry starts laughing. Jerry, stop laughing. Jerry. And we, we were there for an hour just trying to get this. But they, they kept saying, well, that was so funny. That was a great bit, great bit. And I went, well, the, there's, the ladder's not there anymore. And I went, some guy that, oh. And I pointed to, off to a corner. And I said, that guy gave it to me. And everybody's head turns toward the guy who's now sit, leaning against a wall. And he just did one of these. <laughs> like, as if I got a million. I got I mean, a million. I can hang lights or I can write jokes. You think what do that's you funny? Yeah. What yeah. this? Uh, uh, but yeah, that was uh, that was it. Yeah, it was funny. But you, but you, I, I kind of want to. I love to hear the about um, the type of auditioner, uh, you know, like really, really solid actors are because auditioning is a completely separate skill set, and it's not always what you do when you get the job, because it's a very artificial environment. You're reading with a casting director who just, quite frankly, doesn't give any shits. They just want to get through the day. And so wh- what is your be- audition? T- I assume you don't really audition anymore, but what is your go-to audition technique? Well, first of all, uh, by you saying the casting directors don't give a shit, this is probably you are not going to work in this town. <laughs> uh, <laughs> To all of you casting directors out there, I'd like to just say, I don't believe what he said. Before the show, Brian said no. you all were no. bad people. No, and he, Stop it. And he, and they, you were not nice. Stop to, it. All right. Um, totally said. No, it's, uh, it, they're, they're trying, but there's so many people and they have to narrow it down. And, and I just got into this headspace. Like it, I'm, I tell young actors this, and, and this is something that liberated me when I was about 20 years ago. And it was, I realized that I was making a huge mistake. I was going into an audition thinking I was there to get a job. It was an audition. They're, right. they're casting for a television show or a movie. And so naturally you would think, oh yeah, it's a job interview. Go in there and do your best to interview for the job and hopefully they'll like you and hire you. Well, what happens when you want or need something from someone? Desperation. Desperation. You're reaching, you're hoping that they give you affirmation or they give you a job or they like you. Do you like me? And it's like, oh, no, no, no. I, may, I did this all wrong. And so I realized from that point on, I have to go into a room not to get a job, but to do a job. Just hyper-focus on what my job was, and that's to create a, an interesting character based on the text that you received and entertain them. And once you've done that, you've won. If you did in that room what you wanted to do, that's a victory, and you got to leave. And so I took that as my victory. Did I do? Yeah, I did. Okay, good. And so I completely forget about the audition. And I didn't think, oh, I wonder if they're... I didn't call my agent. And wondered, did they like me? Did they call? Did they... You know, nothing. I just dropped it completely. And ever since I adopted that way of life as far as an actor auditioning, I've never stopped working. It seems to have worked out pretty well. Worked out pretty well. Um, I'm all, and now I feel bad about what I said about casting. During. It's not that they don't give a shit. They just... <laughs> remember Just this when sh- I'm in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and you're in trouble because this show is live. This is live! <laughs> uh, let's take some questions from the audience. Do we have a question from the audience we can ask? Hello! Hello! What is your name? My name is Greg. Greg, what's yes. your question? My question is, uh, what's the best prank that you've ever done on set? Uh, ooh, there's been a few. Um, and they almost always involve phalluses. Uh, <laughs> there was a scene in Breaking Bad, that one comes to mind. Uh, there was a scene in Breaking Bad where I take a brown paper bag with a gun in it to Jesse. And I say, remember what we talked about? I need you to do this. And I hand him the bag 
and he opens the bag and takes out the gun, right? Well, <laughs> I did it straight. I need you to take this, and you know what to do with it. <laughs> and he's dead serious, and he takes it and opens it up, and there's a dildo in there. <laughs> Greg, I have a, uh, let's see, what do I want to give to you? What do I want to give to you? Oh, how about this, Greg? A pair of oh, wow. Walter Tidy Whities. There you go, you're very welcome. Uh, Greg, Greg, you may want to wash those. <laughs> no, Greg, don't wash them. If you're a fan, a fan, a real fan wouldn't wash those. A real fan wouldn't wash those. I don't know if a lot of people know this, but... Aaron Paul was not supposed to be in the show past, like, three episodes. He was only supposed to introduce Walter White to the world of street-level drug dealing. He was my conduit. They needed a character to justifiably have this high school teacher now dealing drugs. Oh, well, how do we do that? Well, we need a guy who knows both worlds, him and the drug world. So they hire this kid, Aaron Paul... And all of a sudden, he and I are playing off each other in the pilot, and everybody, AMC and Sony, said, this kid is not going to die. He, we can't have him die. He's so good. And he was. And our chemistry was, like, pow, pow, really sparking. So, um, so that's why he stayed on. I mean, and, he, and then it became what he became. I mean, you, you really, this character was, you were that guy on that show. Well, did, no, I, did, I didn't actually kill people. Yeah, you killed a lot of people, and you made a lot of meth. You did. You did. You killed right, a lot of people. All right, all right, I did. <laughs> That's all we needed, boys. The cops <laughs> <in>. <laughs> There's no talking show. That's, uh, but did you ever, because I'm sure you had very strong ideas about who that character was, were you ever presented with material where you were like, you know, I don't think Walter would do this. Or, you know, was, was there ever, were there ever those I, moments? I, I write about that in the book because I didn't want to write about Breaking Bad by saying, and this was great, and this, this was great, and then this happened, and that was great. and the, It's not reality. But I can tell you, in six years, of six, 62 hours of, of developing this show and shooting the show, um, there were probably four issues that I had on the show. And most of them worked themselves out through just discussing and raising an issue of it. And so, that, I mean, that's the way collaboration works, is that I have a problem with this thing, and can we work this out, and how can we make this justifiable to me? Because at a certain point, an actor owns that character and knows through their own filter what that character would say and do, and not to be not in a, in a way of, I want to be front and center, but just the verisimilitude of that character you have to protect. And so there were a couple times when I went, this is, this is I think, a problem. Like what? Just one example. Um, one probably the biggest example was um, when, when I killed Mike. And Mike goes to the, um, and goes to the Rio Grande to die. And um, I had my gun and, and I had a, a different opinion on, on I wanted to train my gun on him. And um, he said, no, I don't think you need to because uh, he's about to die. And I go, he's a, he's a killer. I, I see he has a gun still in his hand. I, until I get the gun out of his hand, I need to be very careful. So that was one issue that we talked about. And then the last line in that episode, I forget the name of that episode, I write about it. And and it was, I, I said, um, oh, I, I guess I didn't need to get the names from you of those, of those guys you're paying off in prison. I could have gotten them from Lydia. Oh, okay. And it was like, what? <laughs> I, I thought, I, I think that's over the top. I didn't think it was appropriate. I didn't think it was, I know that they wanted the audience to sway away from Walter White and toward the allegiance of Jesse Pinkman at right. the time. So to say something like that would help, certainly, because then he turned into just like a big asshole. Right. Like to say something like that. But I thought his action enough of killing Mike, who became a very popular character, and rightfully so, Jonathan Banks, um, my action enough, that impulsive, 
uh, event uh, would sway them away. And um, we had a disagreement about that. And it was, uh, it was interesting. And, is it, you know, and I look at it all as, look, we're all trying to make this show or any show the best it can be. Are we always going to agree with each other? No. It's, I think it's silly to think that we should. But like any family, you, you state the problem and respectfully try to get to the core of that issue and try to work it out. We have to take a very short break, but more with Brian Cranston when we come back on Talking. Welcome back to Talking with Chris Hardwick. Brian Cranston is talking with Chris Hardwick, me. There are so many interesting stories in this book about things you've seen and where you've been, like... That if, if you're a fan of Brian's, just hearing, just hearing what you were doing when you were 16 years old, working with the police. Yeah. And uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Because that, 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 it was the LAPD Explorers, and that was probably an incredibly impactful experience to a teenage boy. Um, my, my background, my family history was, is, you know, worse than some, not as bad as others. My, my father was an actor. And he wanted to be a star. He wasn't a star by the time he was 40. And it affected me. This major crisis left the family. My mother started drinking. So emotionally, my mother was kind of disappearing. My father was physically gone. We didn't, I didn't see him from the time I was 11 to the time I was 22 years old. Oh, my God. So all of a sudden, there's a void. And, and my brother and I, who's two years older, we're like... I'm 12 or 13 or 14 or 15, wondering, what do we do? How do we do this? Mom is like off into her own world. And um, I guess we're just trial and error. Let's see what's happening. And I joined this police explorer group at the age of 16, LAPD. And it was the right thing to do. I think it was, in retrospect, um, I was looking for a father figure. And very masculine, a guy carrying a gun. And, you know, it's like, wow, that's pretty... So maybe that's what I should do. And I found out that I had an aptitude to it. I went to the LAPD Academy along with 111 other 16-year-olds. And I graduated first in my class. And I thought, oh, well, there it is. That's why I'm, I'm going to be a policeman. That's, uh, I, I didn't know I was good at this. <laughs> so there it is. That's what I'll do. Well, I, I took a class in college. My second year in college, I had to take some elective courses. And I walk in. And, you know, it's, it's September and it's hot and, and this is in the 70s and girls are wearing shorts and tube tops and everything. It was like, wow, this is, there's a lot more women in this class than in police science. The first thing I, <laughs> first thing I noticed. And then it's like the teacher goes there, you two read this scene, you two read this scene, wherever you happen to be standing. And I was standing next to this very attractive woman, apparently. And I got a scene, and I looked at her, and she goes off and starts talking to someone. And I read the sheet. It says, a couple is making out on a park bench. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I look over to her. She hadn't read it yet. And so I'm thinking, oh, boy. Um, God, I hope she's not offended by making out on a park bench. Okay, here we go. And I knew that the, the, I had this sense of... of, of Preening, like you know those National Geographic yeah. shows when the birds like yeah, yeah the dance look at the me, bird of paradise. I'm a good catch. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the ass feathers go wide. Yeah, the the back feathers yeah, are like get off. Hey, check it out. Huh? <laughs> so I start feeling like that, and it's like I'm gonna, I'm just, and so I knew she was gonna read it at some point, and then look over to me, and I wanted to show the best, you know. So I'm, I just no, no. <laughs> You know, trying to pose, trying to put on a good... And uh, she looked at it and went... Looked at me and went... "Hmm." She cocked her head and just went... "Hmm." Like, not bad. I took that as, she thought, not bad. It seems this day the Cranston bird will find a mate. (laughs) (laughs) So we do this scene, and I had the first line, Beth, we need to talk. So I need to push away from the embrace. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to kiss this girl. I'm going to do it. I hope she's ready, because I'm going to do it. I put my sides, the script down on the floor, and before I can fully turn around, whoom, she's on me. 
She's kissing me in hands. She starts moving over in the <laughs> legs like this. She's, she's rubbing all around me. And I'm, remember, I'm, I'm 19 years old. I'm going, oh, oh. Kissing hands, tapping, and hands and kissing and laying and, ta- and tapping. And all of a sudden, like, there was tapping on my leg. And she would tap harder. And, I'm, tap, I'm t- and finally, it dawned on me. You haven't said your line. <laughs> She's saying, get on with it. <laughs> because her character can't stop. She wants to. And I have to go, Beth, we need to talk. So I finally got it. We finally did the scene. It was okay. At the break, I go up to her and I thought, this is the easiest date I'll ever have. I'm going to ask her to lunch. Done. Done. She's into me. So I go up and I say, that scene went pretty well. And she goes, well, yeah, it started off a little rough. And I go, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. And she goes, but yeah, it turned out okay. And I go, yeah, yeah. Hey, would you like to have lunch sometime? And she looked at me as if I was a little lost puppy. I'll do it here. She looked at me and went, oh. <laughs> no, no, I, I have a boyfriend and excuse me. And she left. And, I, and of course, at 19, when a boy is embarrassed, you feign indifference, right? Right. It's all right. Hey, no problem. You know, I just, it's a lot. I can call in. You know, no big deal. <laughs> That's all right. Hey, no problem. And then you're crushed. Like, oh, my God. Two things were happening. I, two things. Two things. <laughs> two things. Two whole things. Number one. <laughs> <laughs> That's how confused I was. First, I just had this experience in school. Right. In my class to kiss and make out with this girl, this pretty girl. That was my job. Right. And I thought, wow. The second thing was she wasn't into me at all. She was acting. Mm -hmm. I would have bet you any amount of money she was into me. She wasn't at all. And I thought, oh, my God. And so I felt not only the exhilaration of making out with a girl as what you're supposed to, but also the power of acting. The power of, of believing something so true and so much that you're taken away. And that spun me around. That, from that point on, I realized, oh, I'm not going to be a police officer. <laughs> I wonder if there can't, you can't tell me there isn't some small part of you. Like when you're nominated for an Oscar and you see your name up on the thing, you're like, I wonder if she's watching out there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to catch that the guy. Remember the guy you didn't want to go out to yeah. lunch with? Yeah, man. Hey, hey, hey. But it's, uh, you know, hearing that your dad was out of the picture and it's you and your brother and did you guys kind of raise each other in that way? I know you guys, like, spent two years riding around on motorcycles. Right. Well, that was that right after that class. I, I left college, two years of college, and I went, oh, I'm, I can't do the police science thing because that's not what, a, a, what do I do? And basically I hopped on a motorcycle with a, with a I think it was like $75 in my pocket. And 1976 yep. and 1975 and left. My brother and I took off. And back in those days, you don't know this, but anybody my age will know. <laughs> in those days, you can get a job anywhere, anytime. It, was, it wasn't a litigious society. You didn't need all kinds of paperwork. you just like, oh, you need a guy to bust your tables. I'll, uh, here, here's $20 and food. And we would bust tables or we would work in a, in a carnival or we would get jobs all across the country and it was easy to do. If you're willing to work, you can get work. And we would fill our stomachs, fill our pockets and the gas tanks, and then off we would go. So we were gone for two years on that, on that trip. But when we were young and my, my parents split up under those circumstances, we lost the house because we couldn't pay the bills. And my brother and I were sent to live with my grandparents for a year. And he was an old... They were both old German stock. Right, you will do this, do it the right way, you know, and this whole thing. And uh, we lived in this remote area of, um, of San Bernardino County in California called Yucaipa. And we went there kicking and screaming. And a year later, we didn't want to leave because he and my grandparents were able to give my brother and I what we didn't have. And that is consistency and a context of things to understand where we were and responsibility, and, it was, and love in their own way. It was really 
thank God it was really exactly what we needed at that time. It's interesting to me that having had the experience of what you went through with your dad, that for you, you still went, yeah, I'm going to be an actor. Like, it, that, no, that nothing set off alarms and went, oh, I don't know, maybe I don't want to be that guy. Were you well, ever concerned about da- that? Well, that's because I'm, I'm not that bright. <laughs> so <laughs> that would have been a thinking man's thought. <laughs> and it seems like it worked out okay. Uh, yes, it did. And I think partly, be- I mean, it was the family business. My mom and my dad met in an acting class in Hollywood in the late 40s, right after the war. And they had this torrid affair, and then they got married in those days and started having kids. Right. And that's what they did. Um, But I think what, in retrospect, what helped me is that, you know, we're always learning from our parents. In the best of circumstances, you're learning how to behave as an adult, what to do. In some ways, in many ways in my experience, it's what not to do. So they clearly went different paths, but I looked at both paths and I thought, no, don't want to do that, and I don't want to do that. So somewhere here is where I belong, and I'll just have to find that on my own. But I think my dad, um, he was so in his head, and the ego of it, and the hubris of, of being a star, that that's what drove him crazy. Some kind of elusive plateau of some sort. That's what he was after. Whereas I, realizing that, my goal was to become a working actor. And that's what I said, is that to become, to make a living as an actor, however that is, it could be meager some years, it could be better some years. That's my goal, and that still is my my most uh, precious uh, professional accomplishment. Well, yeah, because there's nothing about you that makes me think that you care about being famous or any of the stuff that comes along with it. It's like you like working and you like things that are fun and challenging to you. And, you know, when you're the number one name on a call sheet, you know, as you are most of the time, that, that, that number one name really sets the tone for what the set's going to be like and how everyone else reacts because there really is a trickle-down effect. Yeah. And it seems to me, from people that I've talked to and from my experience with you, is that it's important for you to make sure that it's a, it's a good, solid fun, you know, dramatic at times when you're doing hard work, but, but kind of supportive environment in that way. And that it's not about uh, ego stuff. I, I have a saying that uh, I want the drama to be in the show, not around the show. Right. Um, so I don't. I, uh, we have a good group of people wherever you go. And yes, I do want to set the tone and, and say we're here to create and have a good time doing it and then go home. Um, we, you make a family in, that, in those six years on, on Breaking Bad, in the seven years on Malcolm in the Middle. You make a family. I was six months on Broadway with the play. And you, every, every night before we would go on, we're holding hands and saying a little prayer and listening to you know, some inspirational speaker. You know, just give us, revving us up and ready to go. And you go out on stage and you know, punch him in the face. We're just going to take a short break. We'll be back with the delightful Brian Cranston in just a few minutes. We'll see you. Hey, you came back. Thank you. We're back with the wonderful Brian Cranston. We have a video message from a fan. Uh, Let's cue it up. Hi, my name is Sage from Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, You've been doing a lot of biopics lately, portraying real people such as Dalton Trumbo and Lyndon Johnson. So it seems appropriate to ask, if a biopic were to be made about Brian Cranston, which actor would you want to have portray yourself and why? Which actor, a uh, biopic? Would you want to play you? I don't know. There's a certain young man who I think might have the ability oh, to. Brian, I'm so and, embarrassed uh, right now, but I, I mean, this is an incredible honor. Oh, no, I, I, I wasn't speaking of you. I was, oh, of course. Wow. Of no. course. You probably um, meant someone ju- like. You know, Justin Timberlake. Sure. Or, uh, <laughs> Ryan Seacrest. Ryan but, Seacrest. Hey, Seacrest! 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 Uh, we have another audience question. What is your name? So my name is Juan. Hey, Juan, what's your question? So, Brian, I read online that when you did a bit in Malcolm in the Middle, when you were covered in bees, the look on Hal's face, that was you actually freaking out. Is that true? And how did the producers get you to do the bit? My, my uh, creator of that show, Linwood Boomer, told me at the very beginning, we're going to have you do a lot of stuff, but I would not ask you to do anything I wouldn't do myself. I went, okay, that's fair enough. And he came to me one time, and he said... Would you take a look at this picture? And I look at this picture of a guy wearing 
thousands and thousands of bees. Like, it looked like chain mail. And all you saw was his face. He was, he was just completely covered in bees. I went, wow. He said, would you do that? And I said, yeah, I would do that. And he goes, great. Oh, by the way, I wouldn't do this. So, <laughs> so they had this image of me covered in bees. And then they had to go backward and reverse engineer the justification of how the story got to that point. And, uh, yeah, there were 75,000 bees. I was wearing bees. And uh, I got stung twice while, while wearing bees. And I realized one main thing. When you're wearing bees, it's not a surprise if you get stung by it. <laughs> one time, I was standing there, and a bee crawled down into my... Cr- yeah. <laughs> crawled down into my crotch, unbeknownst to me. Anatomically, if you put pressure on the top of a bee, its, its hindquarters just whips up and stings. Oh, just sh- automatically. So you that's felt something why go down your pants, you got an erection, <laughs> and then it immediately stings, 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 Oh my God, this is a fetish now! <laughs> so I've become a beekeeper. <laughs> In every sense of the word. They keep me, I keep them. <laughs> you didn't get stung in the... Wait, did you... I got stung in the nuts. You got stung in the nuts. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the guy, the beekeeper said, if you get stung, let me know immediately. And he's got a little thing that he flicks, he flicks out the stinger and it, it minimizes the sting completely. It's right. like almost nothing. So I go, oh, I think I got stung. He goes, where? Where? <laughs> And I go, in the nuts. <laughs> and he goes, sorry, man. <laughs> Just like that. Uh, oh, uh, I have a very special gift for you. An autographed copy of A Life in Parts by Brian Cranston. Uh, I like to wrap up the show by asking, you know, like just a good piece of advice, you know, like some nugget of wisdom. Is there some mantra that you lived by or something that you, you know, picked up somewhere uh, riding a motorcycle or from your grandfather when he was forcing you to chop the heads off chickens (laughs) when you were a kid? Is there any kind of a thing that you live by, some piece of wisdom that you would share? Uh, Yes, I'm... um I have a show now called Sneaky Pete that I created um, and is is doing really well. And I was called Sneaky Pete when I was a kid. Because of that um, breakup with the family, and I was kind of left alone. So I used, uh, alone, left alone to your own wiles. You, you try whatever and trial and error. But I was a kid who, was, who would try to circumvent responsibility and try to uh, avoid you know, this and that, and looking for the shortcuts. And, and it kind of stayed with me until I really realized, oh, the, the idea of life is to find something that you're passionate about and fall into it, give yourself over to it. So whether or not it's something that you will eventually do professionally or if it's just something, an avocation, it's, it's what life is for, is to get up every morning and devote yourself to, to finding joy in your life, the things that bring you joy and empowerment. And um, that's what I did when I decided to become an actor is that it brought me tremendous joy. And, and so I, I try to tell people that, that if you were that person who was still trying to find themselves, reintroduce you to yourself to that, that thing that brought you joy. And it's never too late. It doesn't matter how old you are you can make something of it and, and live a joyous life. I really appreciate it. I hope you had a nice time I had a great today. Time. I mean, it is, it is so great. We were sort of talking at the commercial break a little bit about how like, you said, like, oh, I never really get to have like, a conversation no, on a show great. before. And it's true. No, they, they try to get a quick sound bite from you, and, and you're, then you're thinking, oh, I, got, I have to think of something really clever right now. Or else <laughs> no, well, but here I was, you made me feel that I don't have to be clever at all. <laughs> <laughs> what a tremendous compliment. Oh, my gosh. Brian Cranston's book, A Life in Parts, is available now. I believe by the time this airs, the paperback version will be available as well. Uh, Always check in with us at Talking on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to find out who's going to be on the show and how you can be a part of it. We certainly couldn't do this show without you. Thank you so much for being here, Brian Cranston. It was excellent to see you. Brian Cranston has been talking with Chris Hardwick. I'm Matt Hardwick on the Tweets and Instagram. Please don't text and drive. I will see you next time. Bye-bye. 
Now leaving Nerdist.com. Enjoy your burrito.